The sailor likes to appear unburdened and happy, but as soft and contemplative as he may seem, he is also hard. He has to be. The layperson cannot imagine what it means to be out at sea in a submarine for weeks at a time and in enemy territory. There are days, sometimes weeks, where you hunt for prey without any success. For weeks at a time, the men don't get a chance to step outside to catch a glimpse of the sun and some air. Many of the technicians never even get to see the bridge, and everyone on the ship is on constant red alert. These are the worlds of Harald Busch, a submarine commander serving during the Second World War. Busch was a German taking charge of a U-boat for the Kriegsmarine, but his words would have been familiar for the thousands of other men who served beneath the waves from 1939 to 1945. To Americans and Australians, Brits and Italians, Russian, French, Japanese and submariners of all other nationalities, these words would have meant a sort of kinship whether they regarded Busch and his men as comrades or enemies. Today, we're going to be exploring what it really meant to be a Second World War submariner, trying to learn more about their lives, their experiences, their fears. It's a harrowing journey, but for the many thousands of young men who took the fight beneath the waves, it was a brutal reality. While you're here with us, we'd like to invite you to explore our Ko-fi page. If you don't know what Ko-fi is, it's essentially Patreon without all the censorship and political baggage. Your support on Ko-fi directly fuels our ability to produce unique and exciting content that might otherwise remain hidden in the depths of the YouTube algorithm. In fact, some of our existing videos, like the ones on the Chaco War, the Beagle Conflict, and Morris Cohen's incredible journey, haven't received the recognition we believe they truly deserve. But we're determined not to shy away from such important topics even if they might not align with the algorithm's preferences for promotion. With your support on Kofi, we can give videos like these a second chance, ensuring that these valuable stories and insights reach a wider audience without any concerns about our profitability month by month. We also haven't forgotten to include some awesome weekly and monthly perks for our supporters, so make sure you check out the link below. Submarines were vast beasts. The biggest subs operated during the war were in the Japanese I-400 class, 400 foot long crafts designed as submersible aircraft carriers. The subs of other nations never quite measured up to these leviathans, but they were still enormous. The American Gato class submarines, for example, were around 311 feet long. But size is relative. Yes, these ships would have looked enormous if you sailed past one on the surface or stood beside one in dock. But if you had to spend months inside one of these machines, they probably didn't feel quite so roomy. And it really was months. The submarines themselves could only stay submerged for between 18 and 48 hours at a time, according to some reports, before either resurfacing and opening the vents or sending up a snorkel to capture fresh air above the waves. But missions ran for far longer than this. Depending on the size and class of the sub, up to 80 submariners would need gear and provisions to last up to 75 days. Colossal machines, certainly, but life on board would have been cramped and claustrophobic. As the brutal winter of 1977 gripped the United States, Washington Post columnist and former submariner Joseph Mastrangelo cast his mind back to his youth in the US Navy during the war. In his February 5th column, Mastrangelo painted a grim picture of the life he and his comrades had experienced aboard a sub. These craft were essentially self-contained units. Everything, food, water, power, air, had to be carried and conserved on board, and this meant a daily struggle. Fuel was used up running the condenser that provided water, so the men on board had only a single shower a week, if they were lucky. On longer missions, when fuel was at a premium, it might be significantly less than this. In fact, hygiene was of such low priority that the showering units often became ad hoc storage bays, the crews preferring to stay supplied with plenty of food rather than have a wash. Drinking water was also rationed. Each crew member received a quart of water, just under a litre per day. And then there was electricity. Deprived of sunlight, submariners used lamps to keep themselves sane, but these were deemed a luxury on Mastrangelo's sub, and the practice was quickly banned. Electric fans, providing a cool breeze to help the submariners sleep, were confiscated too. 
Even light bulbs were removed from their fittings, and crew members scrabbled about in the dark with flashlights. When the order came in to return to ports, the crew would have been overjoyed. Now they could enjoy two showers per week on the journey home and get extra rations from the galley. Back at base, they'd go over the mail that had been waiting for them for three months, eating ice cream and enjoying other treats, adjusting to life on the surface before it was time to dive back down into the depths once again. Living out an austere existence, deprived of everything that makes a human human. Existing on top of and around your crewmates in a narrow tube deep below the sea. The life of a World War II submariner was something most of us find difficult to comprehend. Japanese, American, German, British submariners from different nations would have had their own experiences of a life below the waves, but all would have felt a kind of kinship, meeting the same difficulties and encountering the same terrors. With all this to think about, it's easy to forget one other crucial detail. These men had a war to fight. For submariners, combat was a game of cat and mouse. Even the best of the best subs wasn't going to go toe to toe with the battleship or destroyer on the surface. Their strength was in stealth and subterfuge. The craft could strike a torpedo and then disappear below the surface, out of reach of the powerful guns bristling from these enemy ships. Out of reach of the guns, perhaps, but not out of reach altogether. Explosive devices known as depth charges were designed to sink down to the operating depth of a sub and then explode, causing massive structural damage and either driving the submarine to the surface or knocking it out altogether. Even if the submarine withstood the blast, the shockwave would damage the hearing of the men on board or knock them clean off their feet. These explosives had been developed in the First World War and used to pretty good effect against the rudimentary submarines of that age. By the Second World War, the submarines were more sophisticated, but so were the depth charges. Robert Russell Hunt served on the USS Tambor in the war, and he described just how horrifying these weapons could be. Attacking a convoy in a surface attack, the Tambor torpedoed a tanker, illuminating the night as clear as day. In the flash that followed, the observers saw, to their horror, a nice new destroyer looking right at them. They set their craft to an emergency dive, descending 260 feet and coming to rest on the bottom, shutting everything down. We were there, and that nice new destroyer knew exactly where we were, Hunt said. I think on that first run, he dropped about 12 depth charges right on us. He just hammered us something awful. We had a lot of damage from that first run and all of our guys were working on packing leaks. The captain gave the order to get underway, so we started out, and we'd just got moving when he laid it on us again. With their escape route now cut off, the crew of the Tambor knew there was nothing else for it. They returned to the bottom to wait out the barrage. For almost 17 hours, the destroyer hit them again and again as the craft strained and groaned under the assault. Miraculously, the Tambor got away to fight another day. Not every vessel would be quite so lucky. U-68 was one of the most successful of the German Unterseeboots or submarines during the Second World War, sinking more than 30 Allied ships and two free French vessels. Nearly six months after her final victory, the U-68 was at sea again, leaving Lorient and heading southwest into the Atlantic. Off the Portuguese islands of Madeira, she was sighted by the USS Guadalcanal, an escort carrier. The Guadalcanal dispatched Grumman Avenger torpedo bombers and Wildcat fighters in an effort to destroy the German sub. In a panic, the U-68 dived beneath the surface, leaving one man, a lookout, topside to be swept into the sea. The crash dive was to no avail. Depth charges dropped by the aircraft ripped through the water below the surface. The U-68 was struck, and as her men desperately sought to evade the chaos erupting around them, she was ripped open by the explosions. The only survivor of the U-68's crew was the lookout, left to fend for himself on the surface. In most cases, there were no survivors at all. Another one of Germany's leading U-boats, the U-124, sank almost 50 Allied and free French ships and damaged several more. In March 1943, she too left Lorient for another mission, her 11th. 
Only a few days into the mission, she engaged the corvette HMS Stonecrop and the sloop HMS Black Swan. Unable to bring her guns to bear on the two Royal Navy vessels, U-124 took evasive action slipping beneath the Atlantic. In pursuit, Stonecrop and Black Swan sprung their trap with a series of depth charges, battering the U-124 and condemning all hands to a watery grave. These are just two examples, and both German, of submarines ripped apart by depth charges. But this was a constant threat for submariners of all nations throughout the war. 52 American submarines were destroyed in the war with more than 3,500 lives lost. The Royal Navy lost 79 submarines, along with several thousand men. For Nazi Germany, the losses were even more extreme. Of the almost 41,000 men who served on Germany's U-boats, 28,000 lost their lives. On January 30th, 1945, the Wilhelm Gustloff, a converted cruise liner, set sail from Gottenhafen in Poland, bound for Kiel in northern Germany. On board were thousands of German refugees, including military personnel and civilians, fleeing as the Red Army closed in from the east. As she traversed the Baltic Sea on that bitterly cold night, the Wilhelm Gustloff was not alone. Tracking her was S-13, a Soviet submarine commanded by Captain Alexander Marinesco. The Wilhelm Gustloff did not bear the insignia of a hospital ship, so perhaps the attentions of Marinesco and his crew were justified. As the S-13 drew closer, however, they must have noticed that the brightly lit convoy was not even trying to defend itself. The guns aboard the ship were frozen solid, while the submarine tracker of her escort was out of action. After following the ships for more than two hours, Marinesco ordered his crew to surface swinging across the stern of the Wilhelm Gustloff to her landward side. Here, still unopposed and poised like a cobra in the darkness, Marinesco ordered the attack. Three torpedoes struck with devastating force. The initial explosions killed hundreds, including all but three of the women's naval auxiliary personnel on board. In the panic that ensued over the next 40 minutes, many more would die. The ship collapsed on its side, sending many of the survivors plunging into the icy water. 1,252 people were rescued as the Wilhelm Gustloff sank beneath the Baltic. More than 9,300 were not so lucky. This is an extreme example. In fact, it's the most extreme. No other single maritime event caused more loss of life during the war. But it's far from a unique incident. The history of submarine combat in World War II is littered with these horrifying, heartbreaking events in which great ships were turned into slaughterhouses. In 1944, the Royal Navy submarine HMS Tradewind torpedoed the Japanese Junyo Maru, hitting her four times and sending her to the bottom of the Pacific. The Junyo Maru was a hell ship, one of the Japanese Imperial Navy's grim collection of slave and prisoner transportation vessels. As she sank, the Japanese crew took the only lifeboats and used axes to fight off the drowning POWs and Javanese slave laborers who tried to claw their way aboard. Also in 1944, American submarines sunk the Japanese Ryoseimaru, Toyamamaru and Tomatsumaru troopships. In each instance, between 4,500 and 5,400 lives were lost. In 1942, the British passenger ship HMS Laconia was torpedoed and sunk by U-156 off the remote Ascension Island in the South Atlantic. A rescue attempt was launched by the submarine, mainly because of the realization that hundreds of Italian prisoners were among the drowning. An American plane witnessed the rescue and bombed U-156 anyway. At least 1,658 men lost their lives. This resulted in the Laconia order forbidding any German sailors or submarines from rescuing enemy victims following an engagement. This was the nature of submarine warfare, emerging from the deep and striking with immense force against the enemy, then slipping away again out of sight. Far out at sea, with no hope of rescue, heavy casualties were almost inevitable. Often, these casualties were not combatants at all, but captured prisoners of war, civilians, medical and aid workers. The submarine crews had their orders, but these orders often involved extreme moral dilemmas. To strike or not to strike, a legitimate target or a potential war crime. For the submarine crews who made it home after the war, 
the knowledge of those grim days out in the ocean, days in which thousands of lives were lost in just a few short hours, would have weighed heavily upon them. When Joseph Mastrangelo spoke about reading his three-month-old mail whenever he returned to port, he wasn't kidding. Underwater warfare was still in its relative infancy during the Second World War, and crafts out there on the waves were essentially cut off from dry land. The adoption of higher radio frequencies and specially modified antennae in the early years of the war made communication a little easier, but these were military channels delivering coded messages back and forth. They didn't exactly provide much comfort. This left submarine crews in an almost unique position. Heavy bomber crews were similarly isolated, existing in cramped conditions with almost no hope of escape if everything went wrong, but for far shorter periods of time. Long-range special ops forces like the SAS or the Chindits would have become used to surviving alone in tough conditions for weeks or even months at a time, but this would have been very different to listening to the creak of the hull and the roar of the engines a hundred feet below the surface. These crew understood that they had a very particular mission, something that would play a huge role in potentially winning the war. And yet, still, they were cut off from the rest of the struggle. They wouldn't know what was going on at the front, what was going on back home. They would know barely anything except the inside of the container they called home. As soldiers, sailors, and airmen discussed their experiences on their return, the submariners would have found it very difficult to relate to the stories of their comrades other than the constant threat of death and destruction that lurked every single day. Submarines, and those who sail in these craft, are sometimes known as the silent service. This is appropriate given the nature of underwater warfare. Hunting targets below the waves, unleashing a brutal assault, then slipping away again as swiftly and as stealthily as they'd come. But it's appropriate for other reasons too. Submarine missions were often classified in an effort to keep sensitive information out of enemy hands. The submarines of the United States Navy ran numerous covert missions in the Pacific theater during the war, and other nations undoubtedly had plenty of their own clandestine underwater activities going on, too. Even on lower security missions, deck logs and other documents contain only scant information. US submarine deck logs from the period tend to be pretty low on actual military detail, instead focusing on day-to-day -day operations that wouldn't be of much use to the enemy. Robert Russell Hunts on the USS Tambor described how he was not permitted to keep a diary, although he found a way to do so anyway. The scarcity of recorded information means that many stories are tragically lost. Stories that would have helped us better understand what life was like for those aboard these vessels. It was probably difficult for many of the friends and family members back home to comprehend what they heard when their loved ones returned to them. Years spent in an alien environment beneath the waves, battling often unseen foes in the vastness of the ocean, scrabbling over water, electricity, food. It would have seemed like a wholly different world. In many ways, it was a wholly different world. Warren H. Link served in the 6th Submarine Squadron and spoke of the training he'd received at the beginning of his service. Claustrophobia tests and an exercise involving swimming through a submerged submarine tower were part of the reality for these new recruits embarking on a strange and terrifying adventure. Another submariner, John Close, described how he once became stuck fast within a cramped compartment when his body swelled up in the heat. His crewmates used fans to cool him off until he could free himself. These are experiences that would break many of us, and yet submariners had to take them in their stride. And this is all before we've even considered the combat. But what do you guys think? Was the submariner's experience dramatically different to those of other combatants? Were submarines used effectively in the war? Let us know all that and more in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new.